Welcome back, folks, to another Pathfinder 2e guide. I'm Frizz, and today we're going to be going over pretty much everything related to athletic skill, and it's pretty much just all the general stuff about athletics that most characters are probably going to become aware of as they make their character or in normal play. As you could probably guess from the name athletics, it covers a ton of different actions and can be used across a wide variety of situations. This video will be covering everything from grappling to jumping to swimming to all of the different skill feats that athletics has available. Grab some snacks since this is going to be a little bit of a long one, and let's just jump right into things. Let's start with climbing, which is one of the most common uses for athletics that probably every character is going to use at least once during a campaign. You can climb whether or not you're trained in athletics, which is, you know, a reasonable assumption, though how effective you'll be at it will depend a lot on your bonus for the role, since if you're not trained, you're not going to have a good modifier, so you're not going to be very good at climbing, but you'll be able to climb some things. Climbing is a single action that you can use with the move trait, that you can only use if both of your hands are free, which can make climbing in combat a bit hard if you're a martial character that isn't a monk, because you're probably going to have a weapon in one hand, which you'll either have to drop to the ground or just stow it normally. Then you can make a roll whenever you're near something that you're trying to climb. Regardless of the result of your roll, you're flat-footed unless you have a climb speed whenever you're climbing because, you know, it's a bit uncomfortable and awkward to be climbing something with both of your hands to defend yourself so you're easier to hit. If you get a success against the DC of whatever you're climbing, then you move 5 feet per 20 feet of movement that you have, which generally for most characters is going to be about 5 feet. If you happen to be even slower, you still get to move 5 feet. There is a minimum cap of 5 feet. If you critically succeed, though, then you get to move an additional 5 feet, so 10 feet for most characters. Thankfully, if you just fail, then you don't fall. This is relegated to critically failing on your roll, which means that you immediately fall and you land prone whenever you land on the ground, which is probably going to happen regardless, because if you take any fall damage, then you land prone. Thankfully, Paizo was fortunate and kind enough to give us a bunch of sample DCs to make GMing a lot easier. Now, if you run into a situation where someone is going to be climbing something that is in this list, you can just grab this DC. According to Paizo, climbing a ladder or a low-branched tree is a DC of 10, which is something that pretty much anyone can do, and they're not going to be falling unless they roll a natural one, so you can probably hand wave this. Climbing up a rope or a normal tree is a DC of 15, while a wall with small handholds is a DC 20. Climbing on the ceiling or on a rough rock face that is not in any way designed for climbing is a DC of 30, and a perfectly smooth surface is a DC of 40. Climbing is a pretty straightforward action, and hopefully it's pretty easy to implement into your games, and it works out well for you. Force Open is a rather peculiar action that is basically just meant for whenever you don't have someone in the party who's trained in theory and you really want to get something open. It's a bit more of a crass solution than actually picking a lock, but sometimes if you want to get into a chest you just have to rip the damn thing open. It's a single action with the attack trait, and if you don't have a crowbar or any other way to get leverage, then you take a minus two item penalty on your roll. If you get a success against the DC that you're rolling against, then you break whatever you're trying to open as you get it open, giving it the broken condition and probably making a lot of noise and leaving clear evidence of what you've done. If you're dealing with a particularly well-made object, then that object might just take some damage rather than getting immediately broken. So yeah, you can crack open some wooden chests, and in this case I genuinely do mean crack it open. If you get a critical success against the DC, though, then you get it open without breaking it, which is generally going to be a lot better because it means that you're not destroying someone's property. If you critically fail, though, then you jam whatever you're trying to get into, giving everyone a minus two circumstance penalty on checks to force it open, which, of course, is not going to be ideal. Paizo gives sample DCs again for this, so let's go over them real quick. It does also raise some interesting uh, questions about high-level characters. Breaking through fabric or flimsy glass is a DC of 10, while ice or sturdy glass is a DC of 15. Breaking through a wooden portcullis or a flimsy wooden door is only a bit less manageable with a DC of 20. Sturdy wooden doors or metal bars tend to have a DC of 30, while stone or iron doors have a DC of 40. 
This means that high-level characters who will have a good athletics will be a complete nightmare to actually trap up if you're not using anything magical, since they can just basically break through anything in their past. Also, Paizo does specifically call out that you can use this action to break through walls if you get a good enough roll, which is weird to me because they didn't include any examples of that in their sample DCs, so I'm not sure exactly how you calculate it. But I feel like it'd be safe to find something suitable, like if it's an ice wall, then maybe just take the DC of 15 of ice, then add 10 to the DC because it's supposed to be a lot harder. But I'd just like that if it was a bit more evenly, like, lined out for us. Grappling has historically been an incredibly complex thing in Pathfinder and D&D. Like, there are entire flowcharts for how grappling works in Pathfinder 1E, but thankfully it's a lot more simple in Pathfinder 2E. Grappling is a single action that you can only use if you have a free hand and your target isn't more than one size category bigger than you, and also they have to be within your reach. You attempt in athletics checks against the target's fortitude DC, and if you succeed, then they have the grabbed condition until the end of your next turn, or until they escape, or until you move. Because you're not immobilized, but if you move, then you give up the grapple. Grabbed is a really annoying condition to have to deal with, and it makes all manipulate actions that you have have a 20% chance of failure. Unfortunately, this doesn't affect attacks at all, so the person that you're grappling can just stab you a bunch, but it is really debilitating for spellcasters as most spellcasters are going to have somatic components, which means that the spell itself has a manipulate trait, meaning that every spell has a 20% chance of failure unless it's just a verbal spell. This is a nightmare for spellcasters to deal with, because spellcasters are not very likely to have great athletics, acrobatics, or unarmed attack rules, which are the things that you have to use to be able to escape. So you can really mess up a spellcaster's day by grappling them. Things get even worse if you manage to critically succeed on your grapple check, as they are now restrained until the end of your turn, or until they escape, or until you move, meaning that on top of being flat-footed and unable to move, they can't use any actions of the attack trait or manipulate trait unless they are using the escape or force open action. This is so much worse for spellcasters, since now they can't even try to cast any spells that would get them out of your grapple. No Dimension Doors for them, because Dimension Door has a somatic trait, and also, no freedom of movement, because guess what, that also has the somatic trait. The effects of the grapple action on a failure are naturally not ideal, because you, you know, you failed. If you fail, then you don't grapple them, and if they were already grappled by you, then they immediately lose the condition. If you critically fail, then you obviously lose the grapple, and if they were already grappled, then they're no longer grappled. and they can immediately grapple you. Like, they don't have to roll. They just immediately grapple you. Or they can choose to make you fall prone if they don't want to grapple you. Obviously, you'd like to avoid those outcomes if at all possible, but chaining together grapples over a set of turns can really change the outcome of a fight, and can really just control an entire encounter. I'm serious when I say that grappling is one of the best ways for martial characters to take characters just straight up out of the fight. Like, some spellcasters just will not be able to get out of a grapple. To completely explain the high jump action, I first need to explain the leap action. Thankfully, leap is pretty simple. The basic leap action doesn't require any checks and allows you to make a short, calculated jump. It generally takes one action, and you can leap horizontally 10 feet if your speed is at least 15 feet, and you can leap 15 feet if you have a speed of 30 feet. You land in the square where your leap ends, meaning that most characters can clear a 5-foot gap without needing to roll, but if your speed is at least 30 feet, then you can clear a 10-foot gap without needing to roll. If you try and leap vertically, then you go a whole 3 feet up and 5 feet over, and you still have to land on the surface. This might not seem great, and it really isn't, but keep in mind this is the basic action. So it does get better if you invest some feats in it, and also it gets a little bit better with the high jump. Now that that's out of the way, let's just talk about the high jump. It takes two actions, then you can stride up to your full speed, and then make a vertical leap. You then attempt a DC 30 athletics check, and if you succeed, then you move 5 feet vertically, rather than the normal 3 feet from the leap action. If you critically succeed, 
then you can get a total of eight feet off the ground, or you can, you know, get the five feet off the ground like a normal success, but move ten feet horizontally instead of five feet. If you fail, then you leap normally, getting the normal three feet up and five feet over. If you critically fail, though, then you fall prone. Also, it's important to keep in mind that if you cannot stride at least 10 feet during a high jump, then you automatically fail and fall prone. Long jumps are substantially simpler than high jumps, and are probably going to be used a lot more, since they're really useful without having to invest any feats into them. It takes two actions to do a long jump, and you stride, then make an athletics check. The DC of this athletics check is how far you're trying to jump. So a DC of 20 means that you're traveling 20 feet. If you succeed on the check, then you go however far you're trying to leap. But no matter what, you cannot leap further than your speed. So if you have a speed of 25 feet, the furthest that you can leap with a long jump is 25 feet. If you fail on that check, then you leap normally, which probably is not going to be enough. And if you critically fail, then you leap normally, but you land prone whenever you hit the ground. Also, if you can't stride at least 10 feet, or if you're jumping in a different direction than you moved in your stride, then you automatically fail. There are actually times where leaping is better than striding, because leaping through the air means that you don't have to deal with any difficult terrain on the ground. So keep an eye out for that, because there are definitely times where jumping through a swamp is faster than running through a swamp. Shove it is an extraordinarily simple action. You make an athletics check with the attack trait against the fortitude's DC of a target that's within reach of your free hand. Reasonably enough, this target can't be more than one size category larger than you since it's really hard to shove something actually like 16 times your weight. On a success, you push them 5 feet directly away from you, and you can follow them if you want, but you have to move in the exact same direction as them. If you critically see, then you can choose to push them 10 feet away from you, but that is a choice. You don't have to push them 10 feet away, it's that you can push them up to 10 feet away. So, if you don't want to push them that far, you don't have to. If you critically fail, then you fall prone because you tried to push yourself up against something way, way too heavy and hurt yourself somehow. Shove is super, super simple, but when you need it, it can be very impactful. It's great for shoving people off of cliffs, or for just getting someone out of a doorway so the rest of your party can get into the room without having to tumble through. Another important thing to keep in mind is that shove is forced movement, meaning that any movement that a target takes does not provoke attacks of opportunity. Meaning that, you know, you can't shove someone away from a fighter and have them whack him. It just doesn't work like that, because they're not moving of their own volition. The swim action is, to the surprise of literally no one, pretty similar to the climb action though there are some other risks involved that you're going to have to deal with. Mainly, you're going to have to deal with holding your breath and how the current works. You can generally hold your breath for a number of rounds equal to 5 plus your constitution modifier, but you lose air twice as fast if you attack or cast spells. I'm not going to be going full into depth on the drowning rules here since that's not the focus of this video, but I encourage you to go look them up, if only to make yourself more scared of fighting underwater. If you don't succeed on a swim action on your turn, then you either sink 10 feet, or you get moved by the current at the end of your turn. It depends a lot on what the GM thinks is more accurate. You also don't get affected by that if your last action on your turn was to get into the water. How far you can actually swim in water depends on the result of an athletics check. If you succeed, then you move 5 feet plus 5 feet per 20 feet of movement on your land speed. So for most people, that's going to be 10 feet. On a critical success, then you move 5 feet further than normal. If you critically fail, then you're in a real, real bad spot, since you make no progress so you don't swim anywhere, and if you're holding your breath, then you automatically lose one round of air. This can be very, very bad if you're not trained in athletics and get stuck in an underwater combat or just have to swim in a very, very tough to swim in set of water. Paizo gives some sample DCs here as well, fortunately, so let's go over those real quick. Still water is normally a DC of 10, and Paizo also says that in most calm water, you can automatically succeed on checks to swim without needing to roll. So thanks, Paizo, that makes things a lot easier. Flowing water is like a river, where it's a DC of 15, while a swiftly flowing river is a DC of 20. Swimming through a stormy sea is a DC of 30, while a maelstrom 
or a waterfall is a DC of 40. Yeah, you heard me right. You can swim up waterfalls if you're good enough. Keep in mind that if you can reliably hit a DC 40 athletics check, you're no longer comparing anything that you're actually doing physically to real life, and you're comparing it more to, say, superhero movies. So, yeah, a DC of 40 isn't actually all that unreasonable. Also, there are a lot of feats that improve swimming, so if you think you're going to be around water a lot, then there are some very nice goodies coming right up. Trip is another extraordinarily simple action. You make an athletics check against your target's reflex DC that is at most one size larger than you while you have a free hand. If you succeed, they fall prone. If you clearly succeed, then they fall prone and take 1d6 bludgeoning damage due to how hard you make them hit the ground. If you critically fail, then you trip over yourself, making yourself fall prone. The additional damage on a critical success is somewhat useful at low levels, but at high levels it hardly matters at all whenever things have like 300 hit points. Prone itself is a strong condition, so the damage itself isn't all that important. Against things with poor reflex DCs, trip is a terrifyingly effective option, since yeah, something being prone makes a huge, huge difference in a fight. The disarm action is pretty similar to grapple, shove, and trip, but I'm not a huge fan of how it was implemented. You have to have a hand free, and the target can't be larger than one size category than you, like all of the other maneuvers, and you attempt a athletics check against their reflex DC. On a success, until the start of that creature's turn, they take a minus two circumstance penalty on all attack rolls with that item or on any other checks that require having a good grip, and any attempts to disarm them get a plus two circumstance bonus. This is alright, especially if your allies are also going to be trying to disarm the target, but the penalty to their attacks isn't going to be all that helpful unless the target has an attack of opportunity since it goes away at the start of their turn. If you critically succeed, then you actually manage to disarm the target, knocking the item to the ground in their space. If you actually want the item to be out of their hands for long, then I really recommend grabbing that off of the ground to stop them from just picking it up on their turn. If you critically fail, then you knock yourself off balance, uh, making yourself flat-footed until the start of your next turn. While being flat-footed is obviously not ideal, it is manageable because it's just a AC reduction, so you're gonna be taking more hits and more criticals, so it's obviously not good, but it's not like you're knocking yourself prone where you have to spend a full action to recover from it. Overall, I am not a huge fan of how Disarm has its main effect tied to critically succeeding. I, I wish that the normal success had a bigger impact on the, how the game would actually get played, because normally it's just going to not have all that much of an impact at all since you're not all that likely to attempt multiple disarm attempts in a row, and they're certainly not very likely to critically succeed considering that you're going to be taking a multiple attack penalty. The armor assist feat is interesting, as it allows for you to get people into and out of armor faster. Normally putting on medium or heavy armor takes like 5 minutes, but if you use the armor assist feat and succeed on an athletics check, then you can reduce the amount of time to put on the armor by half. My main issue with this feat is that it's not really going to help you out in, in situations where you actually need to get your armor on quickly. If you get jumped in the middle of the night without your armor on, even with the armor assist feat, it will still take you two and a half minutes to get your armor on, which isn't very feasible at all in combat if you're doing things in initiative. It could be useful if a town that you're staying in gets attacked in the middle of the night, so the time that it takes for you to get outside and start fighting would reduce like civilian casualties or something, but that isn't going to be happening nearly as often as whenever you're being camping in the woods and you get jumped by some goblins. I wish that this scaled with your proficiency as like a lot of other feats do, where it would have like additional effects if you were, say, a master or legendary, because that would make it so much more useful. And it would really be an interesting feat then for someone who is in heavy armor to take, because as it is, it's really not that good. Combat Climber is the first feat that it improves the climb action, and it's very simple. You are no longer flat-footed while you're climbing, and you don't have to have both hands free to climb, you just have to have one. 
This makes climbing in combat a lot easier, which is kind of a no-brainer considering that it's called Combat Climber, since you'll no longer be super easy to hit while you're climbing, and you don't have to drop everything that you're holding. Yeah, it's just a basic increase. What more do you want me to explain? Hefty Hauler is a kind of funny feat since it actually has nothing to do with any action tied to the athletic skill, and more it has to do with how people who are trained in athletics are probably pretty ripped. You can carry two more bulk than normal, which is a pretty nice boost, and this increases both your encumbered and your overburdened state. Sometimes you really just cannot deal with being encumbered, but you really have to bring along something that would make you encumbered. So this is pretty nice. This way you can carry around all types of stuff without having to be worried about being slowed down. You know how I mentioned earlier that sometimes leaping is better than walking normally? With Quick Jump, that will become a reality much, much, much more often. Now you can use High Jump and Long Jump as a single action and you don't have to perform the initial stride. And you, you don't actually stride at all when making a quick jump. So it's just the jump part. Think about it this way. Moving for one action, for most characters in difficult terrain, you'll be able to get 10 feet. If you perform a long jump with the quick jump feet, and you can reliably roll a 25, which will happen at some point if you're specking a lot into athletics, then you can move 25 feet with one action rather than 10 feet, which means that you're going two and a half times further with one action. You probably noticed a trend of me saying that all of the athletics maneuvers can only be done to creatures that are one size category larger than you or smaller, but the Titan Wrestler feat changes that. Now you can attempt to disarm, grapple, shove, or trip creatures that are up to two size category larger than you, and up to three size categories larger than you, if you are legendary in athletics. Now you can have to grapple all kinds of creatures, though whether or not you will succeed depends a lot on the type of creature. Generally, huge or larger creatures will have great con scores, so their fortitude saves will be insane. So grappling and shoving huge or larger creatures is going to be really hard. On the other hand, the bigger something is, the worse their dexterity scores tend to be, so tripping or disarming huge creatures might actually be easier than for medium-sized creatures. So it's entirely up to you on what kind of action you think is going to be most useful for a creature of that size. Underwater Marauder is a great feat for campaigns where you think that it will be underwater for a significant period of time. Normally, whenever you're underwater, you are flat-footed unless you have a swim speed, and you take a minus two circumstance penalty on melee, slashing, or bludgeoning attacks. The Underwater Marauder feat, you're no longer flat-footed, and you don't take those penalties. If you think that you're going to be in the water for a lot of fights, then this feat can legitimately save your character's life, because you'll be so much more effective with it. The lead climber feat is alright, but it's fairly situational. Now whenever you're climbing somewhere and your allies are using the follow the expert exploration activity to climb and follow your steps, you can help them if they get a critical failure. When that happens, you can attempt an athletics check against the same DC that they failed against. And if you succeed, then they only fail instead of critically failing, meaning that they don't fall. However, if you also critically fail, then you both fall. This is alright, but only if you're going to be climbing a lot and multiple people in your party are not trained in athletics. If you think that this applies to your campaign, then feel free to take Lead Climber. But in a lot of campaigns, I personally find that this might not be coming up all too often. Powerful Leap is a great boost to jumping, and it's actually a lot more useful than I originally thought it was before I started out in this video. It's a boost to the basic leap action, and it can really help you out with all types of jumping. The part that I didn't understand was how it interacted with the high jump and long jump actions, since leap is actually a part of those actions. Powerful Leap has two different effects. First, whenever you leap vertically, you can get five feet up rather than three. Secondly, whenever you jump horizontally, you jump five feet further. Basically, Powerful Leap gives you effects of succeeding on the high jump check whenever you're jumping vertically, but whenever you're jumping horizontally, you go five feet further even if you're using the long jump action. So basically, you're getting a plus five foot untyped bonus on your long jumps, since 
how the DC is calculated, it's basically like a plus five, or you can also think of it as a minus five reduction to the DC of the check. It's not all that complicated whenever you really sit down and think about it, but it can be a little weird at first to wrap your head around. The rapid mantle feat improves the grab and edge reaction, and it makes it way, way better. Normally, grab and edge reduces the fall damage that you take, but even if you do do that, you're still going to be dangling in a dangerous position because grabbing an edge is literally just grabbing an edge. You're still going to be hanging over whatever fall you were originally doing. Rapid Mantle allows you to pull yourself up from that edge whenever you use the grab and edge reaction, and you get to stand up on top of it. So it's basically giving you two actions, the pull yourself up part and the probably stand up part. So you basically just get way way better at pulling yourself up whenever you're dangling over somewhere. Also, you can use athletics rather than your reflex save if you'd like on the grab and edge reaction, which might be the case if you have a bad reflex save class. This is great, but I don't really know how often you're planning on falling off of high places to take a feat like this. To the surprise of basically no one, Quick Climb improves the climb action. But one of the big draws is how it improves once you become legendary at that athletics. Whenever you take this feat, you move 5 feet further whenever you succeed on a climb check and 10 feet further on a critical success. This is really nice, although you still can't move further than your speed. But that's pretty unlikely to be an issue. This is a real great boost to your climb maneuverability and combining with it with the combat climber feat, you can really just scamper around if you want. Speaking of scampering though, once you become legendary in athletics, you get a climb speed equal to your land speed, which is insane. The reason why this is so insane is because there are hardly any ways to get permanent speed types that are this fast. This is especially crazy for monks or swashbucklers since any boost to your land speed will carry over to your climb speed. To put this into perspective, there are feats that give climb speeds to different types of ancestors, but for the most part that'll be half your land speed, or maybe just 10 feet, not your full land speed, so you can really get fast. Take a guess at what Quick Swim does, I dare you. Yeah, it's just the Quick Climb feat, but for the swim action instead of climb, you get to move 5 feet further on a success and 10 feet further on a critical success. And if you get legendary proficiency in athletics, you get a swim speed equal to your land speed. Everything that I said about Quick Climb is relevant here, so this is absolutely fantastic. While athletics only has a one legendary feat, as you'll see, both Quick Climb and Quick Swim feel like legendary skill feats. And also, the other two level 7 feats also scale with your proficiency, so they're also sort of like legendary feats. But let's just get to those, why don't we? Because there's no point really in wasting my time saying things again that I previously said about Quick Climb. Wall Jump is the feat that improves your jumping for this level, because there seems to always be one of those. Now you can continue jumping as long as you're next to a wall at the end of a jump. If you're adjacent to a wall, whenever you have moved as far as you can during your jump, you can spend another action to immediately jump, so you don't fall right away. These jumps can be the normal leap action, or horizontal or vertical leaps. You can only use wall jump once per turn at level 7, but if you're legendary athletics, then you can wall jump as much as you want in a turn as long as you have actions. This is somewhat limited for vertical leaps due to how you don't actually get all that match height with them in the first place, but it can help if you do need it. Where this really shines is with horizontal leaps, as now you can leap like 25 feet across a cave land on the wall on the opposite side, and then jump to get around a corner that otherwise would be really annoying to get around. Who doesn't want to be a ball in a pinball machine? Water Sprint is another insane feat of physical prowess, and it continues the trend of just letting people who are really good athletics basically do whatever they want as long as it is somewhat reasonable. As long as you are striding in a straight line, and you spend at least half your speed on solid ground, you can move any of the remaining distance over a level body of water. If you don't end your movement on terrain that can carry your weight, then you do fall through. 
If you're legendary in athletics, though, then this gets much, much better. As now, so long as you start your action on solid ground, any part of your stride can cross water's surface, even though you aren't moving in a straight line. This means if you have a 30-foot movement speed and you start on solid ground, you can run up to 25 feet across water. You do still fall into the liquid at the end of your movement, though. This is great for multiple reasons, but it is very important to ask your GM if this works with just water, or if any liquid would work. It's better to ask that ahead of time before you try and walk across lava. It's pretty much a constant water walking effect, though only for short distances, but it will never be easier to just cross a river. And yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. As with most legendary feats, Cloud Jump is absolutely insane. You can now jump triple the distance with long jumps, meaning that a 60 foot jump is just a DC 20 check, which is probably impossible for someone of this level and proficiency to fail. Also, whenever you high jump, you basically just ignore all the previous rules on what a high jump means, and instead you use the long jump calculation. That means if you want to jump 30 feet straight up, you just have to roll a 30, which at this point is probably a cakewalk. This is an absurd difference to the normal high jump, and I find it absolutely hilarious. It gets even better though, since while you can't move further than your speed whenever you jump, you can now spend additional actions whenever you long jump or high jump to raise the limit on how far you can jump. For each additional action that you spend, you add your speed to how far you can leap. With this feat, if there's any difficult terrain, it is probably better to just leap to where you want to go, rather than to walk there. And you can jump wherever you want. Picture this for me. A monk jumps 30 feet straight up into a tree, then spends two actions to jump 120 feet off into the distance with the wall jump feat. To do that, they would just have to pass a DC 30, and then a DC 40 athletics check, which by level 15 is really reasonable to achieve. If that doesn't make you want to take this feat, then I think you should seek help. I'm a big fan of how athletics is implemented in Pathfinder 2e, and if you need me to tell that to you, then I've been doing a pretty bad job of expressing myself. Pretty much everything is well thought out and well explained, and the feats are generally really, really strong. My only wish is that the Force Open action got a bit more love. Currently, it has no feats that are tied to it, so I wish that it got some. It's similar to the Sunder action from 1e, but it explicitly targets unattended objects in the environment, and I feel like that has a ton of untapped potential. I love feats that allow you to break certain types of objects easier, or maybe even a feat that makes your destruction more hidden so it's harder to spot a forced entry. Whenever Paizo gets around to putting out a book focused on skill and general feats, I hope that Force Open gets the love that it deserves. Also. Paizo, I know that it doesn't matter because you probably have already decided on all the books ahead of time, but if, if anyone from Paizo is watching, you really need to put out that book, as now that Secrets of Magic has been released, I really feel like the skill and general feat section of the game is the part that's the most anemic in the system, but that's a video for another day. Also, while there aren't all that many feats that help out with grappling or with any of the other maneuvers, Almost every single martial class has feats that make those actions better, and the wrestler archetype explicitly fills that void. So I invite you to look into those options if that's a playstyle that you're interested in. And wow, while you look at that, I actually just made a video on the wrestler archetype. Look at me actually organizing my videos for once. Thanks for watching. This has been a really fun video to make since it covers so many different parts of the system that I have had to tie together and try to explain. And it's actually helped me realize that I've been reading some rules wrong for like over a year now. I didn't realize that Powerful Leap actually impacted long jumps and high jumps, which makes it so, so much more useful. If you've learned something, then comment what you've learned down below. And it's nice to know that I've helped people discover a bit more about this system, and I love that sweet, sweet serotonin. Also, if I made any mistakes, or if you've got any constructive criticism, then that would also be a great reason to comment down below since I read all of the comments. If you liked the video, then you should, you know, like the video. And if you liked the video, then you should also subscribe. Until I see you next, live a wonderful life.